So hello and welcome to the Android Dev Summit 2019 and the second day of the Ask Android live stream. We are here in the ADS sandbox. My name is Lila Fujiwara and I'm a developer advocate for Android. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Galpin, and it's great to be here at ADS19. If you're just tuning in, hashtag Ask Android is our live segment where we answer questions that you have submitted to us on Twitter or on the YouTube live stream using the hashtag Ask Android. And I want to take this chance to give a big shout out to all of you who are watching on the live stream from around the world. We've got viewers from India, Germany, Cameroon, Indonesia, Canada, Turkey, the Philippines, Hungary, and Peru. And there's more. Hi to those viewers in the UK, Bangladesh, Mexico, Nepal, the Congo, Italy, Sudan, and Pakistan, Brazil, and the Netherlands. Wow. <laughs> so that's amazing. Thank you so much for watching. Now, next up, to answer your questions about Kotlin and coroutines on Android are Florina Muntinescu and Sean McQuillan. Now, Florina and Sean are both developer advocates who work on Kotlin. Florina also works on architectural components and is a tech lead on Plaid. And when she's not doing that, she leads the Kotlin Everywhere program. Now, Sean works on motion layout, is the author of the Kotlin X coroutine test library. He's also the author of Coroutines on Android, a blog post series, and is a Udacity instructor for all of our current Kotlin offerings. Okay, so with all that, hopefully <laughs> they will be able to answer the Kotlin question. Uh, so remember to tweet them, keep tweeting them, we're taking them live. Uh, but the first question that I have for you all is, what is your favorite Kotlin feature? Ooh, um, can I start with this? Okay. Um, I would say a lot of the features from the Kotlin standard library, but I have one specific. Oops. So I love extension functions, but all the extension functions on collections, I just I love those. So I was doing so many things by hand, all of those like math and group by and so on. But now with Kotlin just being able to call something that's implemented for me, it's perfect. I have to go with interface delegation. It's like this weird <laughs> esoteric feature that you don't use that often. But when you do, it saves you like 50 lines of code. And it's probably my favorite, like, wow, I can't believe this worked <laughs> feature in Kotlin. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I, my, my, uh, I really love the collection class. It's one of those things you don't immediately notice. You're like, wait, I don't have to do all that work myself? And you're yeah. just like, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I totally concur there. Cool. All right, so uh, another, a question I think uh, we just want to make sure our viewers know, um, what are coroutines? <laughs> Can I like answer this shot? Go for it. Yeah. No, you don't want to answer. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so like, if I had to like say at the highest level what coroutines are, they really are a way to replace callbacks. Uh, so when you normally make a, a some code run on another thread and then come back to the main thread. You have to do something in order to like synchronize that, that result and return it back to the main thread. And the way you classically do this is with, with callbacks. And that code can be a little bit verbose, a little bit boilerplate-y. Uh, coroutines kind of like simplify that code and make it so you can do it um, all in line and write it as if you're writing like sequential code that never switched threads at all. Um, so they really kind of help simplify your ability to do kind of background processing on Android. OK, so with that in mind, uh, we got a sort of interesting question that I slotted into the Kotlin segment, which is a little bit funny. But um, so the question is from uh, Johnny Mnemonic, what is the way to handle background threads in Android with Java? I'm asking this question uh, as the docs refer to async task, and then there's some like upset faces. <laughs> um, uh, looper handler, work manager, threads, runnables, uh, executives, maybe services. And maybe we could add, like, can I use uh, co or coroutines on Java to that list? Um, so I don't know, what are? Your thoughts so, on that? <laughs> step one, convert your code to Kotlin, okay. and then step two, use coroutines. Uh, I mean, I definitely do recommend that. But barring that, if you uh, if you're using uh, the Java programming language, uh, the the simplest thing you can do is to use executor service, uh, and that'll let you run code on the background. You'll have to, you know, use callbacks to get results back to the main thread. Um, and then the other, the other option really is to go into Rx Java, which allows you to have like quite a bit of flexibility with how you architect and build your application uh, in the Java programming language. So um, I would not try to use coroutines from <laughs> the yeah. Java from programming Java. language. <laughs> yeah, it's just not, it's not a great interrupt so, story. Yeah, and, I, and I think a big thing here too is that work manager is kind of thrown in among all of those, and work manager is not a way Way to run things on a background thread. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a way to schedule something that's that's run that that you that would not run in your existing context necessarily. And I think so. I think that lo there's a lot of confusion about work manager because we talk about background work, but we're not really talking about multi-threading work. So so just to clarify, going back to uh, executors and Rx Java and coroutines, can we all think of those at about the same level? Yeah. Okay. I would say so, so. Those are so for example, in Rx Java, you would use singles or completables. I would use a suspend function coroutines. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
All right, um, so Markandar asks, I'd love to see some sample code or Jetpack support using coroutines or channels to lazily provide data to a recycler view adapter, like with a progress spinner or something like that. So from what I know, for now, we don't have something like this. Uh, but actually, that's a good idea of, a, of, of another use case that we should support. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think channels, or would you use flow Like what, when you're thinking about this kind of use case? Um, I would use flows, but uh, Sean, what's yeah. the difference between channels and flows? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so for, particularly for this use case, yeah, I agree. Like, I would also use flows. Um, and the, the real difference between them is like the way to kind of think about it is you should use channels when you're expecting to uh, transfer a value between two threads. Uh, and you would like maybe reach for uh, like a blocking queue if you were doing like basic thread programming. Uh, so that's like really where channels really shine. Um, and they do suspend both sides if the, if the queue's full. Uh, whereas a flow is really better served, I think, for this use case of I have some data, it's updating over time and I'd like to pass that up to the screen. All right, so Arif from the live stream asks, uh, what are the differences between Java threads and Kotlin coroutines? What are the differences between Java threads and Kotlin coroutines? Uh, so the, it's, it's one of those like kind of complicated questions because it, it goes really deep. Yeah. Um, but it, it's really, when it comes down to it, uh, the, the threading model basically does not allow, uh, in the threading model, uh, to pass values uh, at the end of a thread. Like, you don't like launch a thread, do some computations, and then get a result out of it. Uh, you always have to add this, this callback interface uh, every time you want to pass values between threads. Uh, whereas coroutines, uh, they do allow you to use the, the threading model in you know, Android, uh, but you're allowed to pass values more simply by using the, the coroutines implementation in the programming language. So basically, coroutines cover more. like. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they simplify do, things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. More lightweight yeah. and, and, yeah. and they're not even necessarily bound to threads. It's really a mechanism for calling this kind of thing. It just happen, We just happen to use a thread-bound implementation. Mm -hmm. um, OK, um, so uh, another one from the uh, live stream. Nikki Thompson 27 asks, is there a difference between the use cases that live data and coroutine flow support? Yeah, so what I like about live data is that it's really connected to the UI, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to pass, when you're observing it, you have to pass a life cycle. Whereas, let's say by default, when you're thinking about coroutines, you don't really have that. But what coroutines bring, uh, brings is scopes. So you would run a coroutine in a scope. So this, you could say this is a similarity between uh, live data and, and coroutines. Um, but then I think you were talking about use cases yes, as use well. Yes, use cases, exactly. Um, what I like about coroutines is that you can use them away from something that's very specific to an activity or a fragment. Um, live data also allows you to do that, but not as easily as a coroutine would. Yeah. So in, in terms of your architecture, then, would you would you, would, would coroutines be something you'd be happier putting into um, into like your repository layer then? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I would use coroutines from the database, because now we also have room support mm -hmm. for uh, coroutines up until the view model. And then maybe only in the view model, I would make that connection to, to live data mm -hmm. and use the, the live data between the view model and the UI. Mm -hmm. okay, so maybe a more specific example of this. So Adam uh, Sherwitz asked, is it acceptable to pass a coroutine scope into a repository as a param, uh, the use case being uh, room calls nested inside an async Firebase listener uh, like a the on complete add on complete listener. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, uh, you shouldn't like really be concerned about sharing coroutine scopes. They're they're kind of lightweight objects. Um, they naturally encapsulate a life cycle. Um, and they really, if you go like dig into the implementation, it's like two references. Uh, it's like it's a really lightweight object. Uh, so you should feel pretty comfortable uh, keeping them. Uh, the, the this specific use case, though, uh, I would say like it's also a really good idea to consider whether flow is going to fit there as well. Uh, it sounds like maybe a callback uh, a callback flow is going to be able to solve that really really well, and maybe you won't have to pass the coroutine scope. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, and I think it's about really understanding what you're trying to do. So if it's a database operation, chances are you want this to be related to maybe the activity, the application scope, not just the activity scope. You want to make sure that wherever data you're maybe saving in your database is really saved independent on whether your user pressed back or not. Mm -hmm. So yeah, keep these things in mind. OK, so another question that uh, came in from the live stream. Um, is there any good example from Google for showcasing usage of Kotlin coroutines with Android architecture components with like an MVVM pattern? 
I actually think we have a lot of things for that. So we have uh, several samples on the ar uh, architecture components um, uh, GitHub repository, but uh, then we also have, I think, I think several code labs. I think we're also using them in our Udacity courses. Um, I know that we have several articles that also cover uh, some of these things. What am I missing, Sean? Yeah, I, I mean, that's the, I'd also <laughs> mention the, there's the live data builder sample yeah, as well. Exactly. Um, yeah, and it does a whole architecture behind the live data. There was a talk at I.O. about this too, specifically, right? Like yeah, the new yeah. sort of architecture components plus um, coroutines mm -hmm. and some uh, develop documentation pages as well. I'd also mention um, Jose and you just gave a talk at uh, at this conference. Yeah, uh, this you, conference can it, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, and so uh, you can check out that talk. It covers how to use flow with architecture components as well. Great. Okay, awesome. All right, so I want to, all right, um, uh, Tazomaniac asks, uh, will <laughs> Google's Dagger ever be Kotlin or Android architecture components friendly? So maybe focusing on the Kotlin part of that. Um, I know, uh, and we'll skip the rest of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I hope um, Said, if I'm not mistaken, has, uh, <laughs> hasn't seen uh, the talk that just happened before. It was on, uh, on dependency injection in Android. Because um, one of the things that are mentioned there in that talk is uh, that we're working actually on improving Dagger and Kotlin support. So for example, right now you have to add several uh, JVM specific um, annotations to some, uh, some modules uh, or some fields in your modules and that's something that we want to remove. Or for example, for qualifiers you have to do something like add field and then the qualifier name. Well, we want to remove that field for you and then let Dagger all of, do all of that magic. So I would say coming up soon in a yeah. Dagger <laughs> library next year. Stay uh, tuned yeah. for more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think, I think we're having Yeet and uh, Jisha on to talk next, and we're definitely going to touch on this a little bit more. So stay tuned for that as well. All right. So um, here's, a, here's, here's a question. How do coroutines handle exceptions? This is from Eugenio, by the way, on the live stream. So at the uh, like at the highest level, the way to think about this, it's it's kind of like a it's a, it's a thing to think. They just throw exceptions the way that exceptions normally work. Uh, so like when an exception gets thrown, it kind of unrolls the stack, and then there's an exception handler, and you catch it in that exception handler. Uh, so that's when you're coding with coroutines, you just code that way, and it works. Uh, the way that actually works, if you dive a little bit deeper, is what the coroutine does is when the exception gets thrown, uh, if it was suspended uh, at some point previously, it resumes that coroutine with an exception. And, it, and when it resumes, it immediately throws the exception, kind of keeping as much of the stack traces it can piece together on the way there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great because it means that you can, you can actually just treat it like ordinary code, which is really important. Yeah. Exactly. OK, so um, Alfred EI Tears, or A Tears, mm -hmm. uh, asks, uh, me and my team are quite used to using ARCs, uh, Java, and Kotlin for managing asynchronous work at I.O. I'm always striving to test new technologies, so code chains and flow uh, has surely caught my attention. What would be your top reasons to move away from RX and into coroutines? I actually have uh, no top reasons to move away from RX and into coroutines. I think uh, if you have a large existing code base using RX Java, uh, you know that's awesome, uh, mm -hmm. and you know that's a really great solution that mm -hmm. works for lots and lots of people. So I, I don't think there's any reason to like prioritize rewriting your code base if you're happy with RX Java. But if you're starting a new app. I would say go with the uh, coroutines. Um, I think a lot of the things that uh, RxJava does, like um, completable and single, these are very, as I was saying, similar to the suspend functions, and they're more lightweight. I know that a lot of times people end up misusing RxJava, so starting a new observable or single just to do an operation on the background thread. So I would say maybe also make sure that you're using RxJava for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you're not doing that, consider going more towards coroutines. Do you think there's any value in having like a pure Kotlin code base? And you know, I know, I know there's like build times, there's maybe a little bit of value. But um, um, hmm. I think it's, yeah, build times, I know it's, uh, it's one. And plus, you don't have to do that switch between Java yeah. and Kotlin. I know. I realize now when I try to write uh, a Java code that I'm like, what am I missing? Oh, I'm missing the new keyword. OK. Uh, so there is this uh, as well. So there's, I think there's that extra mind like context switch, switch, context yeah. switch. Yeah. Um, and yeah, what do you think, Sean? Semicolons. I was going to say exactly the same thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I guess sort of, again, with like Rx Java and coroutines, you could say that this isn't a fair comparison. But do you think one is easier to pick up than another if you're just kind of starting off with this? 
So one of the things, one of the reasons we really like coroutines yeah. uh, is because they, it's, it scales really both ways. So it's like it's very easy to use coroutines to do very simple things to make like a one-shot network request and like display that result in the UI. Uh, when you're first starting out with asynchronous programming, which everyone has to do because everyone has to do network programming, yeah. uh, and then. It also scales uh, to the other side when you're building like large, complex applications. Some of the, the top apps in the, the Android App Store uh, can easily use coroutines to build large architectures that work for them. Uh, and so that's, that's something that's really amazing about coroutines is they're, they're kind of easier to use in the, the first usage, uh, and they also scale to very complex usages as well. Cool. So um, this, is, this is a question that came in from the live stream from Alfred. The RXs and reactive extensions are available for Java, .NET, JavaScript. Is there an RX for Kotlin? I think. There's an RX Kotlin library. Yeah. There, is a, there, there is an RX Kotlin library. Um, I was just curious. I haven't, I haven't used it myself, to be yeah, honest. Neither, neither have I, unfortunately. So, so right. yeah. So, so yes. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, tell us what you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> OK, cool. Um, let's see. All right, so here's one. Um, I've started to sort of upskill on testing. How do you test with coroutines? Why are you <laughs> asking the right person? <laughs> Could you, do, you, do you know anything about that? So there's like, there's basically, so testing with coroutines is basically like two different like uh, ways you might go around testing with coroutines. Um, you can uh, kind of treat coroutines as a thing that just executes like kind of in a background thread and then you just spin and you wait for the result to come in. Uh, and this is kind of like behavioral testing, um, which is like a, a really good way to test kind of the correctness of a large uh, coroutine unit. Um, and then when you want to get more fine detail, you want to test like specific concurrency in coroutines, which is going to come up as you build larger coroutine code bases. Uh, there is a library called Linux coroutine test. We're going to have a talk about it later today. It'll be on YouTube tomorrow, probably. Uh, where uh, you can use that to basically control the specific execution of a coroutine, which is really helpful to make sure that your test like, you know, doesn't randomly do a different execution order and flake mm -hmm. out and stuff like that. Um, and also for getting like really down in the details. I mean, like, I need this to happen, and then that to happen, and then that to happen, and make sure that you're testing exactly the weird specific concurrency bug that you want to check. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to see our talk. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason I was being so snarky about that is because Sean wrote large portions of the library, which is yeah. also another reason. If you have more testing questions, you should definitely, with cover teams, like, please let us know. We'll try to answer them for you. So, so another question for the live stream from, from Ari, thank you, um, is, is there any performance overhead with Colin cover teams? And I guess really that's probably comparison to other methods. I think is yeah, yeah doing the similar things. So There's obviously some performance overhead. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, so comparing them to callbacks is I think where where coroutines really should be compared to when mm -hmm. you talk about performance. Uh, they're they're competitive with callbacks. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you use executors, if you use RX Java, you're going to find competitive performance to all of the callback invocations that you have in those libraries. Um, comparing them to regular functions, uh, they do have performance overhead the same way that callbacks have performance overhead. Uh, and so it's it's worth keeping that in mind if you're doing something like reading the character from a network buffer, <laughs> uh, and you're going to do that a couple million times, that might be better as a regular function. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, there's, it works great in application code. When you start writing library code, you should be aware mm -hmm. of the cost of coroutines. That's great. OK. Um, sorry, I think we did answer one of these. So Roar is asking, will there ever be uh, coroutines for Java, which uh, we answered a little bit before that right now. Why, why don't we just ask this yeah. question here, just because just okay. we're, yeah. Well, I think, yeah, so I think we're going to be wrapping up soon. We're sort of seeing from uh, the back that that's the case. So uh, we are close to being out of time. So I do want to thank uh, Sean and Florina for being on camera with us today um, and for sharing all of their Kotlin knowledge and insights. <laughs> uh, so if the viewers out there want to learn more about Kotlin, they want to learn more about coroutines, what should they do? Where should they go? I would say start with developer.tenor.com, then check out our code labs, the Udacity courses, the Medium articles. What else? Um, yeah, and the, we have several samples. We have the yes. uh, the IO sketch mm -hmm. sample. Uh, we have Plaid. So yeah, yeah check those okay. out. Sunflower, yeah. yeah sunflower. And uh, the talks. I think we've been giving talks on how to work with Kotlin and with coroutines uh, in Android, both at Google I.O. and, of course, at ADS. Mm -hmm. yeah. What are some good talks from ADS that maybe Ooh, we should yeah. check out? Oh, we have, uh, so we have Jose and Yeats talk about Flow. Um, we're going to have a coroutines testing talk. And then, were there any Kotlin-specific talks? Uh, yes, actually. There is one on uh, Kotlin and uh, Java, I think. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Nicole's yeah. doing a uh, talk on Kotlin and Java. Today. Yes. Yeah, so definitely so, check that out. Check that out. Um, and if you're willing to, or if you're willing, if you would like to see uh, <laughs> people in the flesh and work with them with Kotlin-related stuff, Kotlin everywhere is still going on. Uh, so you should definitely uh, take a look at that. Uh, if you just Google Kotlin everywhere, you'll be able to find uh, events around you. 
Awesome. Well, thanks once again for being with us. And remember to keep asking your questions using the hashtag AskAndroid. Now, we'll be right back with Yeet and Jisha to talk about architecture components.